Now, let's get right into God's word. We're going to be using also today our NLT. I like I let you know that so you know for those people behind the scenes, we will be using the NLT today uh, during our reading. All right, now, let's go to that. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Usually what I read will determine what the message is going to be. If I'm reading 1 Corinthians, then I'm doing Paul preach Christ. And then when I do uh, 1 Corinthians 15, I'm back on eight reasons why God raised Jesus from the dead. Today is 1 Corinthians chapter 2. All right, we're going to be looking at verse 1 through verse number 5. Paul preached Christ. And, and I'm giving you these because you have to know why. Why did he preach Christ? The day you're going to find out another reason. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse 1 through verse number 5. And then we're going to pray. Uh, we're going to come to this camera right here. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. And I, brothers, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declare to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Somebody said power. power. All right. Why did he preach Christ? Because he's a demonstration of the spirit and, and of power. We know Christ is the power of God. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the what? Power. If your faith is in the power of God, let's see what your faith is in. Right there at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse 24. Let's show you one verse we're going to pray. If your faith is in the power of God, what is your faith in? So he don't want your faith in the wisdom of man. He don't want your faith in the wisdom of man. He wants your faith in the power of God. So you're going to have to know. Romans, Romans 1 told you oh, Christ the power of God. Here, 1 Corinthians 1, 24, just one verse. But under them, we're in the King James. But under them which are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ the power of God. So he wants your faith to be where? In the power of God. In the power of God. And we know right there the power of God is Christ. Okay. Now we're going to pray. Father, we thank you now for the power of God. We thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving us your word because your word, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God. So when we preach Christ crucified, we are preaching the power of God. Nothing can happen until we preach the power of God. Now we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. Thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your son, his death, his burial, resurrection. Thank you, Lord, for all the things that you have given us in Christ. Now we're going to tell you by the Holy Spirit, how do they work? We bless you for that now. Teach us, lead us, and guide us, and help us to understand the new covenant. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. All the with that prayer says, Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you so very much for coming. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2 is a powerful, powerful chapter like chapter 3, 4, 5, right? All of this word is good. All right, so what I want to do today, I want to go to my subject, and then we're going to go to work. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I'm going to be reading uh, the 13th verse first, then I'm going to give you my subject, then I'm going to back up and read 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to talk about it. Uh, first verse 13, we're going to go back there. We're going to go to verse 1. Now, we're going to go to just verse 13. First Corinthians chapter number 13. We're going to start reading with verse number 13. Then we'll back back to verse 1. And then we're going to come forward. All right. So you all want to make me look good now. I always make your pastor look good. Praise the Lord. All right. All right. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're reading first out of the NLT. That's what we're reading on, okay? Uh, just the 13th verse. All right? Then we're going to give you my subject. Then we're going to back up minister the word. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 13 says, Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. 
And the greatest of these is love. So say that with me. Three things Amen. will last forever. Amen. Right. So when God said three things will last forever, he's talking about they are eternal. <laughs> say three things, three things. Are, eternal. are eternal. All right. They will last forever. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Now, we're going to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, but I want to give you my subject first because we, we, we've been talking about power. Say that with me. We've been talking about power. We've been talking about power. Right. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, I'm just going to hold on to my NLT. 1 Corinthians 4, and let's look at two verses. Verse 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 4, 19 and 20. Two verses. God told us something in these two verses. We taught on this. We taught you that the kingdom of God come with power. If you have the kingdom of God, Christ is the power. So you can't have the kingdom. Christ is the kingdom. And if Christ is in you, he is the power. But we're going to have to find out what he gave you the power to do. Because it don't do no good to have power and don't know what to do with it. Amen. So in 1 Corinthians, in the, in, the, in, the, in the NLT, chapter 4 and verse 19, just two verses, 19 and 20. It says, but I will come. Now Paul is talking to the church because the church is wondering why Paul doesn't come. So Paul said, I will come and soon. The Lord, if the, if the Lord let me. See, why would he say that? Because he led by the Spirit. Now, I'm, I'm, I want you to really hear today because a lot of times we say we led by the Spirit, but we do what we want to do. And then when it don't work, we blame God. Or we think God uh, has not done something for us. So we're going to show you that. All right, it says in verse number 19, but I will come and soon if the Lord let me. And then I find out whether these arrogant people just give plenty of speeches or whether they really have God's power. See, otherwise he's he saying, do they just run their mouth? A lot of words. I want to know do they have the power, God's power. For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It's living by God's power. Let me say it again. The kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. See, the kingdom of God is living by God's power. Somebody say you have to live by God's power. Right. So if it's God's power, it's God's ability to live. If it's God's power. But we got to find out what his power is. So that's why, that's why I'm, I'm teaching this message. It says the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It's living by God's power. Which do you choose? Should I come with a rod to punish you or should I come with love as in a generous spirit? So he's talking to the church. So we, sh we saw right there why God gave us his power. I'm going to sit here a minute for you can come up on me. That's what I'm waiting for there. Amen. So God's power. Thank you. It's come on up on me. You don't be afraid of me. Amen. See, God's power is so you can live. He gave you the power so you can live. Right there, I just told you, the kingdom of God is not just talk, a lot of talk. It's living by God's power. All right. But Paul says, I speak this on permission. Now, why would he say that? Because he had to be led by the spirit. He has to, the spirit have to let him know is it okay to say this or not. Okay? Now, that's just one thing. Now, in 1 Corinthians 13, 
let's go back there because I, wanna, I gave you the last verse. Now, the last verse told you these three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. We've already talked about faith. We're not done. We talked about hope. We're not done. And now we're talking about love. Now, now why is God taking us through these things? Because today we're going to talk about love, but we're going to name the teaching love, the power in God's kingdom. Now, you have to you have to know this. You have to know that love is the power in God's kingdom. So you in the kingdom now. So you have to know what is the power that's in the kingdom you in. Let me tell you this. If you were in the world. You ought to know what the power was in the world. Now, in the world, you have lies and hate. That's the power of that kingdom. Let's go to Acts 26, 18. In Acts 26, 18, Paul was given an assignment. We're going to look at this camera right here. Paul was given an assignment. In Acts 26, I'm going I'm to read it also out of the NLT. In his assignment, he was to do something. So we have to know why he has to preach Christ. To preach Christ, he has to preach love. Say that with me. To preach Christ, you have to preach love. See, when you preach love, I'm going to show you, you can't, you can't find fault with people when you're going to preach love. You can't put folks down when you're going to preach love. You can't be judgmental when you're going to preach love. That's not love. So God is going to show you what Paul preached. So that's why when, Paul, when the Bible said, why we were yet sinners, I'm going to show you that. It's the time Christ died for us. We was at our worst. So watch what the Bible says in Acts 26, Acts 26, 18 on the screen. We, we're going we're gonna to give you Paul assignment. See, Paul had an assignment. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, Paul assignment in Acts chapter 26, verse 18. Here we go. To open their eyes. I'm still reading out the NLT. Open their eyes so they may so they may turn from darkness. See, once a person's eyes is open, now he can turn from darkness. Once he has the Holy Spirit, because that's what happened when the Holy Spirit come, he, he give you light. Now you can turn from darkness and you can turn from the power of Satan. Now, wh what is the power of Satan? We know one of the words is ignorance, right? But how many know it's Flesh is not just flesh, it's darkness. But it's not just darkness, it's hate. It's hate. It's rebellion, it's disobedience. It's all those other things. Amen. They'll get you right. They got to get you right because that's not right. So that's what we got to understand. All right, let me go back to this camera over here. All right, so we have to understand to turn from darkness is to turn from hate, turn from ignorance, turn from blindness. So God gave you the power to love. Now, when people can't love, it's because they don't have the power. You just can't love me because you want to. That don't work that way. Because if you can love me, and didn't have the power, you would need God. See, that's what the problem with people is, they can't love. That's why I use the word forgiveness. That's why Paul's message was, then, then they will receive. Let's put that back up there again, Acts 26, 18. So once they turn away from darkness to light, to the, the, the power of darkness already been turned from, they have turned from the power of Satan to God, then... 
said word, then they will receive forgiveness of sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith. Now that place is grace. We talked about that the other day. We have a place. God said, I go to prepare a place. That's the grace. Once he puts you in the place, in the grace, now you're in the grace. Remember, that was a time you were in the flesh. But now you're in the grace, and other folk who you're trying to get saved are still in the flesh. And the only way you're going to get them saved, you got to love them. And that's the problem with the church. That I believe people are pretenders. They're saying they're church people, Christian people, but they can't love. It's an awesome thing to see a person who say they are born of the Spirit and they still talk about hate and lie. See, all that kind of stuff doesn't go with the, what you're teaching. No lie is of the truth. All right, now watch this. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. Watch what Paul says. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to start off there. Now, remember, we taught on faith. We showed you what faith was. How many can remember what faith is? Tell me what, what method I taught you about faith. I said faith provide, faith receives. See, that you got to write that down because I'm, I'm teaching you these three things. You got, these are what you got to live by. These are your tools. So when, you, when God gave you faith, he gave you faith to receive what grace has already provided. So we showed you, and I'm going to show you here in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to start at the last part of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to read the last verse of 1 Corinthians 12 in ELT. Then I'm going to go right over into chapter 13. I'm giving my camera crew a chance to catch up. 1 Corinthians 12, the last verse is verse 31. It says, so you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. Now remember, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul gave us all the gifts. Let me say it again. In 1 Corinthians chapter I'm talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And then in chapter 13, he's going to tell you, am I okay here? In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he's going to tell you how they're going to work. First of all, he gave us, first, back over here. Do I have a picture? Where am I here? Okay, you're back now. Now you can, you can. Use your camera there. There you go. You have to draw me to you, right? You, what you want to do is show the person the big, the big picture, right? Right. Not like he way over there somewhere. Right. Right. First Corinthians chapter number uh, 13, right? We're going to start chapter 12, the last verse. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 12, the last verse. We're going to do it on the NLT now. And then we're going to go into First Corinthians 13, 1. So you have to see that Paul already, here we go. He says, in the last verse in that chapter, he said, but now let me show you a more, show you a way of life that is best of all. So he's talking about the way to live. So he's showing you the best way to live. And then in the last part, he has said love is the greatest. He's showing you the greatest way. Now, if you know Chapter 12, I'm going to have to do this here just to show you to you for tape. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12 and 7. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul began to give us by the Holy Ghost all the gifts of the Spirit. And then he's going to show you that love is a better way. Now, the reason why he's showing you that, because all the things he's showing you in chapter 12, not going to do you no good if you can't love. See, if you're going to be judgmental, say, for example, if you're going to minister to people in some countries, they, not, they might not even wear clothes. What you going to do now? 
I'm talking about tops. Do you hear what I'm saying? Now, what you going to do now? See, you got to understand your responsibility is to get that person saved. Tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're going to take your love. And like I said before, I'm going to say it again. If you don't have the spirit of Christ in you, you can't love. And I know people think they can. I'm telling you, listen, you check yourself out. Examine yourself. Now, I'm not talking. There are people you can love if they are all right. But that's not God's love. God's love, love everybody. Amen. So Paul is giving you his prescription of God's love. It's not judgmental. Let's go back to verse 7. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. That's where we're at. A spiritual gift is given to each of us. Say that with me. A spiritual gift, A spiritual gift. is given to each of us. Now my point is, if the spiritual gift is given to everybody, then why you don't see everybody using the gift? So we're going we gonna to call this gift love. Because it's grace, right? So we can call it love. Now we gave you Romans 12, 3, God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So we, gonna, we, gonna, we know this grace gift, we're going to use it as love. Because God gave it to everybody. So if you're born again, you have the spirit of love. You have the spirit of faith. Now watch what he's going to say in that, in that same verse. He gave us a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. So why did God give you the gift to love? So you can help. Now, you can't do it if you don't have the gift. So you have to understand, you've got to be led by the Spirit. That's why I always tell people, it's not going to work if you're not led by the Spirit. Because you'll pass up everybody on the street, and you'll talk about them. They ought to get a job. They ain't nothing but bombs. They ain't nothing but alcohol. They're going to go by. Some of them people need help. So you're going to have to be led by the Spirit to know which one. Ain't that right? Everybody out there don't need help, but there are some need help, and you're going to have to need the Holy Ghost to let you know that person needs you to help them. Amen. All right, watch what he says. In verse number, verse number seven, he said, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. So he's not talking about he giving you the gift so you can puff your chest out and say, I have the word of wisdom and the word. No, no, no. He's talking about the gifts are given to you so you can help somebody else. So when, but if you don't love, you can't help nobody. Because when them people call you on the phone, you're not going to help them. Y'all don't mind if I sit here a minute, do you? This is just a comfortable seat. You know, when pastors sit down, you're like, is he all right? I'm all right. Praise the Lord. All right. All right. Now watch what it says. To one person is given the, given the spirit, gives the ability to give wise advice. So why do you think God gave you wisdom? So you can give wise advice. So when people cause you, they want that wise advice. Somebody say amen. amen. All right, watch what it says. To another, the same spirit give a message of special knowledge. But why is he giving it to you? To help others. See, all these gifts are given to you to help somebody else. Watch what it said. The same spirit give great faith to another, and some give, and, and to someone else, the spirit give the gifts of healing. But why is he giving it to you? To help somebody else. So that's the whole bottom line. Every gift is given to you to help somebody else. So what happened if you can't love? You're not going to help nobody. You're just going to walk around like I'm the greatest, thing, greatest gift in the Bible. But you ain't helping nobody. Amen. All right, watch what it says. He give one person the power to perform miracles, to another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. See, you have, you have that gift. You have to understand. You got to know when, when, that, when a message is from God. If you got the Holy Ghost... If you, if you don't know, ask him. Because it's got to come out the Bible. 
Ain't that right? You don't have to criticize. Just, hey, you got the Holy Spirit? God will give you the word, the word to know. Is that the Holy is, is that from God? Discern the Spirit. All right. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 13 now, verse 1. I think we're ready for it. We're still going to use the NLT. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 1. All right. Watch what it says. If I could speak all languages of earth and angels, man and angel, if I could speak all languages, now just think about how many languages this is, they are. But didn't love others. See, it won't do no good if I don't love them, right? Hello. I'm in the house this morning. I'm not, I'm gonna be right here. I'm sitting down. It says, I would only be a noisy going or a clinging symbol. All I'm doing is a, a noisy gong. You ever seen the gong show? Yeah. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all God's secret plans, I know them all. I'm possessed with all knowledge. Hallelujah. But I have a problem. If I had faith that I could move mountains, get out of here, mountain. Just that fast. I could tell people, be healed. I could tell, just pop my finger, just say this happened. I got that kind of faith. But watch all the kids. If I had such a faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. What he's telling you, you got the faith, but if you don't have the love, you don't have the power. So that's why Galatians 5, 6 says faith working by love. So you got the faith, but love ain't moving. See, God is in you. Christ is in you is the power. So he knows what I think. He knows my motives. He knows why I'm praying for that person. He knows what I'm expecting to see. Am I? I'm fine. I'm, I'm okay. Amen. I just love this. Amen. That's why I built this edge. It's called the edge. Ford makes the edge. <laughs> Better let that love me. All right, watch what it says. Now, if I give everything I have to the poor, even sacrifice my body, I could even boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I wouldn't have gained nothing. See, that's why Paul talked about giving. And we're going to go, we're going to go in there in 2 Corinthians 8 and we're going to do 9. See, we do 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and we have to know why Paul says something. I'm going to do this and then I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter, and I'm going to look at 8. We're going to do a lot of that style verse 1. Then I'm going to go to first, 2 Corinthians 9. We're going to go to verse 6. We read that all the time we receive offering. And Paul used a term in our giving. And that's what, watch what he says. Not grudgingly. What are you hearing? Now I'm giving you my message. They love is the power in the kingdom. Love is God's power in the kingdom, see? All right. And you got to operate in his power if you want to get something done. Because God is the one that's going to work your faith. Love. Right. So God is the one that's going to work your faith. Otherwise, he's the one that's going to make you look good, right? But if you ain't loving, nothing is happening. That's what Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about, I don't want a lot of talk. I want to know about the power. Can anybody hear what he's saying? Because first of all, if the Holy Spirit has not given you his love, you ain't got nothing but a lot of talk. I like to put it this way, a lot of smoke, but you ain't got no fire. All right. Now, now in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, let's go and show you what he says. He says, I can even give my body to be born in verse number three. He said, but if I, if I don't love others, I would have gained nothing. 
Then in verse number four, he says, told you what love is. Now you watch what he's going to give you, and he's going to give you a definition of, of love. Now I'm going to go to 1 John after a while. I'm going to show you what love is. And we're going to do love today, and we're going to do love today in three categories. You can write these down because I'm going I'm to leave yourself some room because I'm going to give you something on each one of these categories. Category number one, I'm going to teach in this series, in this, I'm not going to change to another series. I'm just going to show you when I teach this, this love. I'm going to show you love is God's power, but I'm going to show you, first I'm going to show you uh, God's love to man, Roman number one. God's love to man. So when I give you God's love to man, you can put things under there for that. Then you can go to man's love to God. So you have to be able to separate love because if you don't, you don't separate love, you don't have it in the right category. So first I'm going to show you God's love to man. Then I'm going to show you man love to God. Then I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to show you your love to one another. See, so that's why you have to have the, the first two. God love to you. God has to be able to have given you his love. If God had to give you his love, then you can't love me. See, you're not going to be able to love Brother Wise Heart. That's my friend back there. You can't love Brother Wise Heart if you don't have God's love. That's the man that burned up all my equipment when I was in skill trade. See, if I, listen, if, if I couldn't love, I'd still be angry. Because I couldn't sit down no more. Couldn't sit down no more, Brother John. He burned up all our seats. He told his guys. That, he was over the whole plant. Told his guy. Cut them all up. Take their torch and cut up all our seats. So we got to work. Next day, we didn't have no chairs. That's the guy back there. That's my friend. Now, who would have thought that we would become brothers and sisters in Christ? Brothers in Christ. Watch this. Brothers in Christ going to the same church. Now, what would happen now if I'm the pastor of the church and I still can't get along with him? God can't send you people, you can't love them. God can't put people in your life that you can't love. Oh, I just love this. I love my seat, brother. You got no reason. Pastor, pastor has a reason why he got this. Okay. All right. Now watch what it says. I'm still in first, I'm a, first Corinthians 13, 4 says in the, in the NLT. I want to leave it on the screen. Love is patient. Now you see what you see. You see the fruit of the Spirit, don't you? He's telling you love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Now you, you got to really look at that and look at your own self. Are you jealous? Don't look around nobody else. Because I, I was, and I, I, I'll confess, I was the most jealous man in the world of my wife. Nobody was more jealous than me. See, when you start laying your hand on the car and she's hot when you get home. <laughs> you jealous man. When you put a stick in the front of your tire to see has it moved when you went to work. You a jealous man. See, a lot of people don't want to confess. See, I was, I was a jealous person. But I had to come to a place in my life where I had to trust God. Amen. See, a lot of times we say, oh, we trust God. But do you trust God your wife? Why, you call every five minutes when she go to the store. Where you at? Why you, check the therm why you check the miles to see how many miles they went? Well, I know what it was on. You ain't jealous. Let me move on. See, I, I'm confessing I was a jealous man. Love is patient, it's kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. Neither one of them. Love is not jealous. Love is not boastful. Love is not proud. And love is not rude. Now that's a word I use a lot. Because you got some people, they're very rude people. They'll do stuff in spite. Hurt your feelings. All right. But love is not like that. It's not irritable. 
And it keeps no record of being wronged. Love don't keep no record of how many times you wronged me. You know, when people do something, you're like, well, see, I ain't going to give you no more because, see, I ain't going to leave you nothing else because, see, I loaned you that $5 and you ain't paid me no $5. Are you kidding me? See, love, love doesn't keep a record of that stuff. Love does not rejoice about injustice. See, one, one of the things I pray for in my prayer list is justice. I want to see justice. That's one of my prayers. One of my things in my prayer list, I want to see justice in, the, in all over America, in, in the government, in the, in the mayors, in, the, in, in cities, I mean states, in, all up the line, Congress, White House, Congress. I want to see justice in the judges, the lawyers. I want to see justice. That's one of my prayers. Amen. See, you just can't talk justice. Pray. Pray to the Father. I want to see this happen. There's no, nobody's above the law. When you do wrong, you're supposed to be dealt with. Amen. It sends a bad signal to the youth and the children. When people in authority do wrong and they just, nobody do nothing about it. And then you got the young people saying, but look what they do to us. That's why I'm praying. And that's why God showed me, said, pray for justice. In this, in this city, in this state, also in this country. That's one of my prayers. All right, now watch what it says. Uh, love never gives up. Love does not rejoice about injustice, but it rejoices whenever the truth wins out. See, love rejoices when the truth wins out. Love never gives up. That's an awesome statement. Love said, love never gives up. Love never gives up. Right, I think the King James said, love never fails. But it, what it means, it never quits. It never gives up. You never give up on anybody. You got to understand, God didn't give up on you. Amen. There are some people that you know could be in your family. Don't give up on them. Amen. You may look at them and say, they'll never be saved. They'll never be nothing. They'll never look, they're even getting worse. But if you got God's love in you, you never give up. You never stop praying for them. You, you, you remember the prodigal son, right? right? That father was still praying for his son. Amen. That son had left home. Got his inheritance and one of them want nothing to do with his daddy. Daddy didn't stop praying. Amen. See, that's where I am. Amen. Four o'clock this morning, I was already in prayer for you. Four o'clock in the morning, I was in prayer for you. Probably about 10 or 15 minutes to four. I was already in prayer for you. And that's what I do. I pray for you every day of the week, sometimes twice a day. I go in my closet, I get my book out, and I pray. See, this talk is cheap. That's what Paul says. Where's the power? Ain't no just talking. Let's, you got to do this. Can't be like the people on TV. We're going to pray for them. They had a tragedy over there. We want to stop right now and bow your head for 30 seconds. Okay, close your eyes. Don't say them. Mm. Okay, that ain't no prayer. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. All right, now here, here's prayer, here, here's love. Love, verse seven, love never gives up. Love never loses faith. Love is always hopeful. See how you still got them two in there? Love endures. Through every circumstance. The word endure means our last. See, because love's not going nowhere. Love's going to be right there to see the victory. Amen. It's already been won, but love is going to see the manifestation because love ain't going to go anywhere. Love's not going to fail. So you have to be able to understand. You're looking at a, a young man, a little young lady. You, you could be listening to me this morning. Listen to me. It's still hope. As long as they got breath in their body, still believe God for their salvation. Amen. Let me tell you something. Man, I'm glad people didn't give up on me. Because like I said, listen, I, I wanted to know the truth, but I wanted the world too. 
And you got to let people come to an age of maturity. And they'll see for themselves. You got to keep praying for them. And I know it looks bad. I'm talking to somebody on that camp. I know it looks bad in some folks' life when you keep getting hurt and mistreated and mistrusted and you keep getting lied to and they keep telling you, I'm going to do that. I didn't do that. And they're just lying and mistrusting and then you got to keep loving. Amen. See, can I go right back in that prayer room again and say, Lord, I, maybe that's why the old, old preacher used to say, here we are once again. It does not rejoice about injustice. It rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Verse 7 says, but it never gives up. Never loses faith, always hopeful, and love endures through every circumstances. Then he's going to tell you about the other things. He's in our prophecy and speaking unknown tongue and languages, special knowledge. It's going to, these things are going to come to a time when they're useless. It's an awesome thing. He's trying to let you know. There are times you come, you're not going to be able to use them. Now, I pray in the Spirit. I, I have to pray in the Spirit because God put, the, put that in me. But at the same time, if I'm not in love, it's not going to do no good. Amen. That's what keeps God gifts from working is we won't walk in love. you got to walk in love. And then it says once again, it said, but but love will last forever. So he's telling them, you got all these things in the church, all these gifts, and you're wondering why I can't pray in the spirit. Paul said, listen, can you love? Seek earnestly the best gift. He said, listen, all these things are good, but can you love? Because you can't love, praying in the spirit ain't doing you no good. Here you are talking to God and you ain't loving. God ain't listening. See, no need of me shundying, shundying to the Lord, and I ain't loving nobody. That's what you got to understand. God looking at your love life. Say that with me, God, God. looking at your love life. All right, he's not trying to see how, 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 how whatever. He, look, he won't know are you a lover to all his creation. Amen. Now, our knowledge is partial, verse 9. Our knowledge is partial, and our knowledge is incomplete. Even, now, he's talking to the people of that day in Corinth. Because remember, he was, this probably wasn't written, but, you know, Paul had it in his notes and stuff. So he was sending the letters to the church of Corinth. So he let them know that at that time their knowledge was limited. It was incomplete. He said, even the gifts of prophecy reveal only part of the whole picture. He said, all these things we have are, are, are partial. He said, but when the time of perfection comes, now remember, he talked about Christ. When the time of perfection comes, then partial things will become useless. He, they was waiting for Christ. So he's letting them know, look, when the Lord comes, all these things that we got in part, we'll see the reality. We'll see the real person. But now we have to operate in these things now. That's what he's talking about. And he's talking about, but right now, you got to get the loving. Watch what he says. Then he says, when I was a child, I spake of the child, I thought of the child, I re reasoned of the child. He's talking about when he was young. He acted that way. But then he said, there came a time when I grew up. So he's using a spiritual term because love is what you want to make sure happen in you. L let, me, let me show you how, how it works. W when a person gets born of the spirit, they receive God's love in them. That God's power in them. Now that power and love in you is Christ. But God wants you, your soul man, to make sure that you grow, your roots grows, your roots of your trust, grows deep inside of Christ himself. Paul used it this way, rooted and grounded in love. Can't you see what he means? That you, 
Your faith must be rooted and grounded in Christ, in love, in his love. See, you don't have, listen, your heart is the spiritual sower. If you compare to a tree outside, you put a tree into the earth, the dirt. And the roots grows deeper, and the deeper the roots grow, the more stable the tree becomes. Amen. Let me say it again. The deeper the root grows into the ground with a tree, the more stable the tree becomes. That's why you look at some of these trees out here, the wind blow, wind blow, they don't even move, seem like. They just barely bend a little bit. It's because the root is so far down in the ground. In so many directions, stabilize that tree. That's what God wants you to do in Christ. He wants you to be so embedded in Christ's love that when the storms of life come, they, they don't bother you. You know what I mean? They, they just bend you a little bit and stand you back up. You go on your way. But that person who just got planted, that new, that new believer, is what we have to be concerned about because it blows him right out the church. That's what you got to understand. Your love for one another is what he wants you to do. So they may not have grown like you have. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Now, now I'm going to finish reading this chapter here. It says, and now he says, but when I grow up, I put away childish things. Verse 12 says, now we see things imperfectly. They were, that's what they were. Like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then he's talking about when Christ returned to them. That's why you got to be able to realize he wasn't talking to you because uh, you already got Christ in you. So he said, but, but then we will see everything with a perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I would know everything completely just as God knows me, knows me completely. See, I know him completely like he know me completely. See, now let me show you this in Colossians. Did, did I give you somewhere so I'm going to go? I thought I gave you some, but anyway, let's go to Colossians. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what you're saying. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Thank you. All right. Let's do Colossians 3 first. Colossians 3 first, then we go to 2 Corinthians 8, 1. When I tell you that, I tell you that to keep me focused. See, your job is to keep me focused. That's why I say where I'm supposed to be going. You know, just like if you was riding with me and we was, we was going down somewhere. Let's go to Louisiana. I mean, let's go down south for a while. And I turn around and say to you, where are we supposed to be going? You know, there's something when I, here I am driving, all of a sudden, you know, I've been driving all day, and I turn around and look at you and say, where are we supposed to be going? And you turn around and tell me, I don't know where we going, John. <laughs> you get halfway to Wisconsin, ask your wife, where are we going? I don't know where we going, where are we going? She's going to say, you better have a map, you better know where we going. All right, watch this. We are in Colossians 3. Now watch the same thing that Paul says, since you heard, verse 1. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ. When was you risen? When were you risen? Right. So when God put you in Christ, he raised you from the dead, didn't he? So you've been risen with Christ. Now, if you're already risen with Christ, how can you be waiting on Christ? See, he can't be talking to you. One day you're going to be like, oh, he wasn't talking to me. That's the whole point. Since, since you have been raised... To, to life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven. Now he's, he, he's trying to get you, it's a mindset, right? He's trying to let you know, renew your mind, right? If I'm going to renew my mind, I can't be indulgent in the things on the table, the baptism pool, the foot wash. See what messing up folk, that ain't in heaven. See, now you don't want to settle. I switched gears one time, John, that you can't handle it. I already told you faith, hope, and love last forever. 
You have an eternal kingdom. You have an eternal inheritance. Everything you have is eternal and is spiritual. See, that's what happened with churches. Churches just playing church. That's why they get nothing out of it. They've been doing it for 50 years, 100 years. They've been doing the same thing. Breaking the same bread, don't even know what it's for. Because that man is not teaching the Bible. The Bible told you in John chapter 6, the bread we have now is from heaven. Jesus, listen, Jesus stood up to him and said, listen, you eating that bread. Your father ate that same bread. <laughs> and they died in the wilderness. But I'm the bread of life. If you eat of this bread, you'll live. For, I mean, just told him. They said, we're going to kill you when you get through talking. <laughs> Because people don't want the bread from heaven. Listen, he said, the bread that I give you is of my flesh. That's what broke their heart. You're going to give us your flesh to eat. They don't understand. He's telling you the bread is going to be his flesh. And what's going to have to happen to his flesh is he has to be put in the oven. And the bread is going to have to be baked. And then the bread going to rise. And then we're going to eat. The, see, and once the bread is finished, we, listen, you don't put the same bread in the oven that you get out. That the change took place. And so the Bible told the people in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, now you the bread. See, the bread is the body of Christ. How, you, how many know that's who we are? And the Bible calls in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, somebody find me that one verse, you are God's bread. You are the bread of God. See, we got to understand, we're the body of Christ. The word body means bread. Verse 17. Verse 17. Would you put on the screen just one verse? 1 Corinthians 10, 17. See, we, we go to church, but we, we, we hear the Bible, but we don't want to take it at its, at its value. The church, watch well, what he said to the church. We, can we just read that together? We, we, come on, we. We being many are what? Come on, one bread. Now, it's something that we the one bread and we eating the bread off the table. Now, something got to be wrong here. We eating up one another in the church. We, we being many are one bread and one body. Can't you see the body of Christ, the bread of Christ, the same word? We are one bread, one body. We are all partakers of one bread. That's, all, that's, that's everybody in here is in here because they have taken their part. You are now the bread of Christ. You are now the body of Christ. Get a lot of big hand for that, would you? Now you see why we don't eat the bread of the table. Before he died, he said, this is my body. In the new covenant, he said, we are the body of Christ. You didn't get it. When he broke the bread, he said, take, eat, this is my body. So we think we're supposed to eat the bread of the table, now we really eating. No, the bread wasn't finished yet. After he rose from the dead, we become one bread. He was telling them before, look, take, I'm giving you an illustration. You're going to break the bread. See, they didn't get it until after he rose from the dead. See, that's why you have uh, the gospel of St. Luke chapter number 24. That's why you have that. Because they didn't see it until he broke the bread. He rose from the dead. And then he demonstrated again. And the Bible says, and then he vanished out of their sight. And, and once he broke the bread again and showed it to them, they realized they were talking about, he was talking about himself. He's really the bread of life. If you eat of this bread, you'll live forever. Well, let me ask you a question. If you eat that bread on the table, are you going to live forever? And that's what people are thinking. Hallelujah. 
Okay, so in Colossians chapter number three, let's go back there again. Okay, here we go. He says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits on the right hand of God, God's right hand. Think about the things, watch what he says, of heaven. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of the earth. Listen at that. Now, if I'm still doing what, what people are doing at the church, they're not thinking about things in no heaven. Because you didn't go to, you, listen, you have to be honest with yourself. That bread on the table did not come from heaven. We got it right down there at Myers. Do you understand? You have to be reality. You can't be talking about that. See, you have to hear what he said and renew your mind to that. He said, look, you ought to be thinking about the bread from heaven. Well, that bread there ain't from heaven. Watch what he says again. Think about the things of heaven, not of the things of the earth. You died to this life. You died to this life already. So why are you still watch the feet? See, if you died to this life already and rose again, why you still got to wash my feet? Your real life is hidden with Christ in God. So let it soak in. Your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Well, if my real life is hidden with Christ in God, then I don't need to be put in the water to wash me because that ain't my real life no more. How many know what my real life now is? See, you got to know, you got to know what your real life is. Let me show it to you. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. You got to know what your real life is. Because your old life is gone. You dead to your old life. And the way you're dead to your old life told you in Romans chapter 7, you're dead to your old life by the body of Christ. Now, you got to get that, what that means. See, I'm dead to my old life, to my old life. by the body of Christ. Now, let me tell you what that means while I'm doing this. My wife and I have been married 52 years, right? She's dead to her old, her old life by Earl Crump. Once, once we came here and got married, she is no more Ernestine Dixon. She died to her, her old life right here. And when she walked away here with me, she was Mrs. Earl Crump. I'm trying to get you to see, what, if you're going to understand marriage, how the woman become dead to her old life. She loses her name. She don't, listen, even in the courts, the name is no more on it. She can go out and say, I want to see my records, Ernestine Dixon. We don't have Ernestine Dixon in the records no more, man. We got an Ernestine Crump. No, I want Ernestine Dixon. And there ain't no more Ernestine Dixon. How many don't know what I mean? That's what happened when you got married. You lost the identity of the old man and you have a new life. And we walks away, Mr. and Mrs. Understand Crumb. Can you give him a big hand there? That's why I tell people we get married. And that's what you got to understand. What happened to Miss Understand Crump? She came down here. Understand Dixon was came down. I know she came in here. What's that? We're going to show you right here. Galatia 2.20. See, you got to know what happened. You got to know what the Bible is talking about. This is a life. We still use it now. Galatia 2.20 out of the NLT. Watch what it says. Galatia 2.20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. Old Ernestine Dixon, it's no longer I who live. It's not Ernestine Dixon who lives no more. But it's Christ lives in me. So when you come down here and receive Christ and you walk back that aisle, ain't no more Earl Crump. No more understand. You understand what I mean? See, that's why you read Romans chapter 7. I, I, you died to the old life by the body of Christ. Because once Christ came into you, he took over your life. He swallowed up your old life. You didn't get it. You didn't know the serpent. You didn't know what happened when, this, when Moses threw the serpent on the... See, he swallowed up your old life. 
You can't find it no more. There's no more Rosetta guy. That's the new Rosetta guy. See, people want to come to church, they want to look for the old Rosetta. Ain't no old Rosetta. Oh, there's a new Rosetta. See, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a new Sister O'Neill over there, right over there. A new one. I don't know what the old one is. No more old one. You, but you got folk here. Well, see, you know, I know him when he, before he was saved, that's where they want to go. They want to find the old guy. I, I, I knew Crump before he, got, before he was a preacher. See, that's what they want. They want to go back there. He dead. He gone. You don't even, neither, you don't want to find that guy. I don't, I don't want you to know him. How, how many know what I'm talking about? I don't want nobody to know that old man. Thank God he gone. See, he used to, he used to live here. But watch what Galatians 2.20 says. Oh my God. Watch what it says now. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer, who, it's not, no longer I who live, but it's Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Somebody said, we switched places. We switched places. Sure did. He, he, I gave him my life, he gave me his. Amen. Amen. So it's no longer I that live no more. It's Christ now who lives in me. Watch what it says. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. I'm sorry, it says, so I live in this earthly body by trusting the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Otherwise, we exchange places. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. Go to, go to I got 50 seconds. Let's go to Romans 8 and 1. See, you got, if you can see this thing, it's an awesome thing. So once Christ comes inside you, Christ is God's love. Now, if Christ is God's love, then your old man is dead. So why aren't you loving? Because when you're born of God, you're born of love. You got a new spirit. There's a new man in the house. And our job is to love like Christ loved us. That's why I'm starting out with God's love to man. I have to ask myself, am I loving other folks like God loves me? So we always hear people, oh, the Lord, the Lord is blessing me, man. The Lord is good to me. The Lord, why are you doing that way to other folks? Amen. Are you treating other folks that way? See, God showed me that. He said, son, get yourself a prayer book. That's what he told me. And start putting down people and start praying for them. He convicted me. And, and, and when I go to 2 Corinthians, we come back. When I go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I'm going to show you in, in, in that verse here. It says, prove the sincerity of your love. See, all that talk is cheap. <laughs> Hallelujah. I like to do the hand bump. <laughs> talk is cheap. Look at King James. There's one verse. We'll do that. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. And verse 1. Just one verse. And we're done. See, this ain't no game. Watch what Paul going to tell this church. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, verse 1. Out of the King James verse. Just one verse. We got to at least do. Watch what he said. Moreover, brethren. No, no, no. We got to back up. I'm not that. Verse 7. It said, prove the sincerity of your love. The verse I want. What an awesome thing. King James. See, if you get to it in your own Bible, you need to mark it. Therefore. Let me find this verse for you. I know I got all these scholarships. Prove the sincerity of your love. Just one verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Is it verse 8? 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. Y'all found it, found it, huh? All right. King James, that's what you want. You got to be in the King James version. 
and verse 8. It says, see, if other verse won't say it. That's why I like King James. Watch, come on, let's read it together. We're done. It says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the fraudness of others. And to prove, watch what he says. You want to online your Bible? Prove the sincerity of your love. Talk is cheap. If you got God's love, you got God's power. That means there's nobody you can't love. And if you love them, you can forgive them. When when you just don't know what they did. You don't know what they did to Jesus neither. But you know what? He forgave. And not only that, there's another young man in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts that they stoned to death. His name is Stephens. And while he was on his face, knees, stoning, going down for the last time, he looked up to God and said, hold not this to their charge. Forgive them. So don't be talking about what they're doing to you. Can you love them is my question. Can you love your enemies? See, we're going to go through this because Jesus said when he talked, love your enemies. Because you just don't know what they did. Love your enemies. And we're going to show you if you love your enemy, there's something you can do for somebody who's, who's an enemy. See, you can feed a person and they're they your enemy. You can still feed them. Amen. I told you about Elijah last week and I showed you, but I, I didn't finish that story. At the end of that story, they were smitten with blindness and he brought them all to the camp. You have to get last week tape. I'm not going to tell you what I said. But he asked the man, he said, look, Lord, open his eyes and show him there's more to be with us than to be with them. I, I gave you that money. And then he brought all those men into Israel's camp, brought them all into Israel's camp, the whole army. And the man says, shall we kill them? He said, oh, no, we're not going to kill them. I know they're our enemy, but we're not going to kill them. Hey, we're not going to kill them. They were going to kill us. Oh, I know they're going to kill us, but we're not going to kill them. So you got to understand something. You saying you can love. Let's find out. Let's find out this in this teaching. How much love do you have? Because you got God's love. There ain't nobody exempt from your love. Can you clap your hands for that? Listen. You got to have God's love. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1 through 4 told us Christ died for our sins. He's buried and God raised him from the dead. You got to believe in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. You receive Christ, believe it. You receive God's Holy Spirit. God's love will come inside of you. If you don't have God's love in you, you can't do this. But if you got God's love in you, you can love one another. You can love your enemies. You can love them who spitefully use you, say all evil against you. You can still love them. You can pray for people and they speak against you. You can still love them. If you got God's kind of love, my time is up. I thank you for yours. And the door of faith is open unto you.